so I am a cradle Lutheran. And by that, I mean that I grew up in the ELCA. I grew up in the Lutheran tradition. I grew up at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina. And then when my family moved while I was in high school to Roxboro, North Carolina, we started attending Mary and Martha Lutheran Church on the north side of Durham until Mary and Martha merged and became Our Savior Lutheran Church. When it came time for me to go to college, I chose Capital University, one of the many schools in the ELCA college and university system. When it came time for me to go to graduate school, I chose the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. Again, there's Lutheran in the name. I say all this just to underline the idea that I know Lutheran stuff. I understand the culture. It's comfortable to me. I am familiar with it. And so I can walk into any church at a time of worship and be present in that community because of my comfortability and awareness. I've been blessed to serve congregations in small southern towns in Columbus, Ohio, on the south side of Chicago, and in Connecticut. And I can walk into any of those places. I have walked into all of those places with a sense of comfortability. When visiting Lutheran churches, I know the drill, the standing and the sitting, and maybe the kneeling. And maybe I'll miss a cue and stand up too late or sit down too early, but I know the general flow. More than that, I know that the greatest social faux pas in worship within the Lutheran tradition is sitting in somebody else's seat, or sitting in someone else's pew, as the case may be. I find this awkward because it's a social faux pas that actually only impacts, only penalizes visitors. Because if you go to the same church every Sunday, you know where everybody sits in the pew. And despite the fact that no church I've served ever actually has assigned seating, it's somewhere in the vibe of most congregations that they feel like it's that way anyway. And I'm not hating on the family here, so to speak. I understand a proclivity toward familiarity. I understand a desire to sit in the same place. I play cards with a group of guys who meet at my friend Mike's house. I enjoy sitting at Mike's dining room table on the left-hand side closest to the window because from that window I can see out his back window and his kitchen window and there's a lot of birds in his neighborhood. At my local brewery, our great community partners Two Tones Brewing, I have the chair that I prefer. And sometimes when I walk in, one of the owners or one of the other regulars will look at the chair, look at me, and with a twinkle in their eye and a smile, laugh and say, hey man, somebody is in your seat. And I laugh and I sit somewhere else. Because to be honest, all of the chairs at Mike's house, like all the chairs at Two Tones, are perfectly adequate for the task of sitting on and them holding you up. But what I'd like to think about today is that experience of being somewhere for the first time being somewhere that's new. Even consider something like a grocery store. I prefer the Aldi here in Whitehall, across the street more or less from the church because I'm in it two to three times a week. However, if I get that itch to travel, if I get that feeling that I just need to swap up my routine, I'll go to a giant Eagle grocery store on the other side of town because there's this great psychological almost disconnect that I could be anywhere because I'm in a different grocery store and I don't know where anything is. And it's fun to explore new things. It's fun to widen my view of myself or my community or my city or my state or my country or even the world. And so I look for new experiences that expose me to new things that widened my view. A few weeks ago, a dear friend invited me to join her at a yoga studio. We went to Danja Yoga here in Columbus in Old Town East. It's an amazing studio ran by these two guys, a couple. They are great, very welcoming, very hospitable. And so I showed up. And it's kind of crazy to think about that room being so big and so sparse. And yet all of the things that happened in that room We gathered and we set up our mats and we sat down and we greeted one another and we started breathing deeply to center ourselves and wiggling our our appendages and starting to stretch and then there were poses and the names of poses and the sequence of the poses and my heart rate slowly escalated and then it was brought back down and then we hit this final pose and as the guy was leading the class, he said, think about if you have a jar filled with water and glitter. 
And you shake that up and it's going everywhere. And then you give it a moment for all the glitter to settle. That's what we're doing now. We're letting everything settle. And then as my heart rate came back down and everything began to settle, we sat up. We took a few deep breaths and we paid respect and we honored the time that we had spent together and the work that we had done together and the humanity that was shared in the room. And we were encouraged to find that peace for ourselves and to share that peace and to be that peace and the, that good vibe for other people that we meet, to, to take what we had experienced together out into the world with us. And I thought to myself, man, that's a lot that's happening in one room that seems to be so sparse. And yet then I thought about the parts of worship that happen in the sanctuary. We gather together and there's the prelude. And after the prelude is the thanksgiving for baptism and the Kyrie and the hymn of praise and the prayer of the day and the readings and the psalm and the gospel and the sermon and yada, yada, yada. And then we end with the dismissal, go in peace, serve the Lord. So maybe whereas worship is the liturgy, the work of the people, I kind of thought of yoga as the work out of the people which I thought was pretty funny. And yet, there I stood in a big room before class started holding this borrowed yoga mat. And the thing that struck me was hot fear when I asked myself the question, where do I set up my mat? I don't know. I don't want to take somebody else's space. And this is a big faux pas in Luther world. What do I do? Where, where do I put it? I took a deep breath, got over myself, because there's always a million reasons not to do something. And I rolled out the mat and we began the class. And we began going through the different activities, through the different parts of the class. And through the class, I was laser focused on the instructor, only breaking my gaze to look at the people who were to my left and to my right. And I was laser focused because I'm very German and in my cultural upbringing and in the family that I was raised in, there's the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things, the right way to do things and the dumb way to do things, the right way to do things and the way that'll get people to say, I don't know that guy, way to do things. And I wanted to make sure I was doing it right in this environment where I didn't know anybody, I didn't know what was happening, I didn't know the poses, I didn't know the name, I didn't know what was coming next, I didn't know what I was doing. And by the time we got to the end of the session, 55 minutes into it, I was absolutely exhausted. But I wasn't physically exhausted, I was mentally exhausted, I was psychologically exhausted from this experience of not knowing what was happening and being on guard the whole time, which is really counterintuitive to a practice that's about centering oneself and being present. But as I got to the end of the practice, I took a moment to think and I asked myself, I wonder if this is what it's like for some people who come to church, who find their way into a house of worship, maybe from a different tradition, maybe for the first time ever, maybe after a time away, maybe seeking, maybe exploring, maybe people come into a sanctuary, they come into a church in order to find God or connectivity or spirituality or that connection with Jesus or any of those things that faith promises and talks about. And what they find is 59 minutes of not knowing what's coming next, 59 minutes of standing or sitting or maybe kneeling, 59 minutes of prayers they may or may not know, creeds they may or may not have ever heard of before, 59 minutes of not knowing what's happening next, which is a very unsettling an exhausting feeling. See, I believe that it takes a certain degree of comfort and awareness in order for people to be truly present. Consider that. I think it takes a certain degree of comfortability and awareness for people to be truly present. And that is important. This Sunday is the fourth Sunday of the Easter season. And for a generation now, this has been called Good Shepherd Sunday. 
And so the reading that we hear this morning is from the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. Jesus talks about being the gate, using this good shepherd imagery, which draws back on this first century practice of there would be a pen where the sheep would sleep, and the shepherd would lead the sheep to the pen, show them where the pen was, lead them into it, guide the sheep into the pen, and then protect them by laying in the entry gap. Thus, the shepherd's body becomes the physical gate. And so Jesus here says, I am the gate. I am the way. I am the way to salvation, which we hear Jesus say in John's gospel often. It's in John's gospel that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. This is nothing new for us, right? It's also worth noting, however, that in six verses, still in the 10th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus also says, I have other sheep of other flock who you do not know. But here, Jesus is using a figure of speech, and John uses that phrase. Jesus is using a figure of speech to talk to the disciples that he's talking to about the fact that he is the gate for these sheep, the gate that welcomes them in to eternal life. But what I'd like to look at is the physicality of this figure of speech. The shepherd is showing and leading, guiding and protecting the sheep. Therefore, as Christians, when we read the words of Christ, what we see is an example of how to treat and care for people who we find gathered in the pen with us, gathered in the room with us, gathered in the worship community, the church, the fellowship with us. We are given this example of showing and leading and guiding and protecting those who are gathered in the pen with us. The summer after I graduated college in 2004, I was living up in the Clintonville area here in Columbus, and one Sunday morning I decided to find my way to a local Lutheran church. It had been a little too long since I had been to church, and I decided that I should go stick my head in the door. And so I visited a church, and I slid in close to the start, and I sat in the last pew, fourth to last pew on the left-hand side, close enough to the door that I could slide out as soon as church was over and not be stopped by people I didn't know asking me to join committees that I wasn't interested in. And as I sat there, right before worship started, the little lady in front of me turned around and said, hello, good morning, welcome to church. I haven't seen you here before, but I hope you have a good day. The hymn book is the green book in the pew in front of you, and the bulletin helps people through the hymn book as we go through the parts of church. If you have any questions, please feel free to tap me on the shoulder. I would love to help you, and I hope you have a good morning. And she turned around to continue to center and prepare herself before worship started. As I said, I know Lutheran stuff. This was 2004. We were still in the Green Book, the book that we used in the ELCA and in its predecessor bodies since 1978. I had the liturgy memorized. That's not the point. The point is that I remember that woman's kindness as she turned around and did her best, interacting with me as a visitor, trying to show and lead and guide and protect someone who she saw as new and a visitor in that community, in that pen, in that fellowship. As I stood there at Danja Yoga in Old Town East, sweating on a borrowed mat, trying not to topple over, looking at everybody else, fearful that I was doing everything wrong, I looked to my left and made eye contact with my friend, who smiled and gave me a reassuring nod a welcomed sign of relief for me that I was doing okay. She did what she could, and it was greatly appreciated to show, to lead, to guide, to protect, to make me feel welcomed. On this Sunday, on Good Shepherd Sunday, we see the example of Jesus our Christ, the welcoming gate, the Good Shepherd the one who shows and leads and guides and protects. May we follow his example. May we show and lead and guide and protect all of those who we find in our pen, in our sanctuaries, in our houses of worship, in our gatherings. 
As we meet those people who are seeking and searching, looking for God, looking for faith, looking for spirituality, looking for community, looking for Jesus Christ, may we show and lead and guide and protect that others might find the calm and awareness needed to truly be present and receive the power of God Almighty through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.